can I ask a question? But uh, this question I was beyond scope of the topic. So is it allowed? Yeah, okay, go ahead. Uh, so my question is regarding non opinion deed quantity. So can you shed some light on that? Uh, what is like the, in, in some uh, very brief way, can you explain the Busha deed quality a little bit? Yeah, I don't know. Am I the only one who didn't understand? Yeah, I was just going to ask, I don't know if the connection is bad on my end or his, but if I understood correctly, was the question um, something about non-abelian T-duality and then asking, can you explain yeah. the Busher rules? Can, can you say it one more time? I think... We, I think yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, exactly. The same question, yeah. Well, I, I mean, I, can, I guess I can last, let Josh answer because it's his talk, but if... Uh, if if not, I can comment on it. I guess either way. I I didn't really I didn't really hear anything. Yeah, he, he asked two questions. He said, "Can you?" Can I'm lagging a lot. So. He he asked, "Can you comment on the Busher rules for T duality, and then also on non abelian T duality, which is indeed outside the scope of the talk. It's not something that you uh, mentioned in the slides. But if you if you want to comment on T duality uh, to address this question, I guess uh, now is a, a good time to do yeah. so. Yeah. Non-abelian T-duality, yeah. I don't know about T-duality. <laughs> okay, yeah, I, I guess I can comment. So for, for people that haven't heard of this, the context is, um, well, the, the theory Josh wrote down describes a string propagating in some target space-time, which we usually think of as being like Rn. So it's just, you know, non-compact, 26 dimensional, like R26, some, some space time or something. Um, he did not discuss what happens when some of the target space coordinates are compact. So let's assume now that the string is being embedded in some space time that has, say, 25 non compact directions, but one of the directions is on a circle, right? So you have a compactified direction. Um, so Josh didn't write down the mass formula, but there's a formula that gives you the mass of a particular string state. And you can write down this formula in the case where one of the directions is compact, like a circle. Okay, great. Now there's a remarkable fact that emerges. When you write down that formula for the mass of a string state, when one of the directions is a circle, there are two different contributions. One comes from the string winding around the circle. So this is a state where the string kind of wraps the circle some number of times. And there's a second contribution from momentum along the circle and they appear in the mass formula in some way. There's a remarkable symmetry, which is the fact that if you take a circle of radius r and exchange it with a circle of radius roughly alpha prime divided by r, where alpha prime is this parameter Josh introduced that is roughly the length squared for the string. So essentially you invert the radius of the circle, send it from r to roughly one over r in some units. Something magical happens. Um, you change the circle's radius in this way, but the spectrum, the set of masses for the string states, stays exactly the same. Now, that's very weird. That's saying, in some sense, string theory can't tell the difference between a large circle and a small circle, because the spectra are the same. Um, it exchanges states where the string wraps the circle to states where the string has momentum along the circle. So that miraculous duality is called T-duality. Um, T for torus or T for target space, however you like to think about it. Um, so then part of the question was about Busher rules. Busher rules are a specific set of equations that say, look, for a target space geometry, some field configuration for the various fields um, in the target space where the string lives, like the metric, there's other fields like this so-called B field and the dilaton, which Josh didn't mention, the Busher rules tell you how to take a particular solution for all of those fields and replace it with a different solution that corresponds to the t-dual geometry. So there's a set of rules. So for instance, the metric, the metric component in the direction of the circle you're t-dualizing along gets inverted, it gets sensed to one over itself, uh, the dilaton transforms, all of this stuff happens. Um, so finally, then he asked a question about what about non-abelian t-duality? Um, what does non-abelian t-duality mean? Well, if some 
collection of your target space coordinates are on circles, so say there's like three that are along circles. So that's like S1 cross S1 cross S1, which is a torus, T3. Um, the T dualities along those directions are said to be abelian in the sense that um, a product of, say, U1s for the circles are all abelian. Um, because each of those groups is an abelian group, so the T dualities commute in a particular sense. Um, you can ask about T dualities in a more general context. So if your target space doesn't have circles, but say a sphere, an S2. Um, so you can T dualize along a direction of the sphere. Imagine taking the sphere and embedding a circle in it along, say, some, some line of latitude or longitude, and you can T dualize along that circle. Um, and in a precise sense, the resulting t-duality is non-abelian. The intuitive way to think about this is that, um, say, the isometries of a circle, like the SO3 that transforms, or sorry, the isometries of a sphere, the SO3, if you like, that transforms a sphere, SO3 is locally isomorphic to SU2, and SU2 as a group is non-abelian. You can think of it as two-by-two two matrices, special unitary matrices. They don't commute. It's non-abelian. So... There is a notion of non-abelian t-duality in cases like that with modified, more complicated Buescher rules. And um, this is something that supergravity people love to study. So you can use these um, solution-generating techniques where you t-dualize along these non-abelian directions to get interesting supergravity solutions. Um, and that's something people still work on today. Um, so anyway, that's a uh, long answer to the question, I guess. But uh, that's the, the big picture um, bird's eye view of what t-duality is. Yeah, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Thanks. Uh, there's another question from Arcat, which is quite typical of him. Uh, he asked, can you categorify strings pathetically if you want to do the meme? <laughs> uh, so I guess he wants to describe uh, the category of strings. But that also made me think, are there different kind of families of strings? Like different ways to kind of, I don't know, like different types of strings or something that can be studied separately. Uh, you might want to answer his question first, though. Yeah, I mean, categorification of strings, I don't know. I mean, maybe Josh has thought about this more. Josh seems mathier than I am. I don't know. Do you, have you seen any categorification of script strings or anything along those lines? No, but like, you know, I guess you could sort of think of an open string and a closed string, like like different topological spaces, and then you a category almost. Yeah, I'm not sure how to make sense of that, but I mean, people often speak about kind of stringy constructions as categorifying analogous constructions for point particles. Um, and I don't know what it means to categorify a string per se, but, um, in a certain sense, uh, in the same way, if you saw my gauge theory talk, as you, if you can think about charged point particles, um, as coupling to a gauge field in, in a particular way, so that loops are kind of, or if you take the particle in a loop, um, you get some holonomy associated with the gauge field. You can also take a string and take it in some loop and get some holonomy associated with a higher form gauge field. And people sometimes think of this as a, a categorification of gauge theory in some sense. I mean, the, the person to Google, if you want to read about this, is Bayes, B-A-E-Z. He has a lot of work on string theory as a categorification, um, which is maybe along the lines of what you were thinking of. But um, for the second question about different types of strings, then yeah, for sure. I mean, Josh already mentioned that there's open and closed strings, um, but there's many, many types within each of these subclasses, right? So uh, this talk was about the 26-dimensional bosonic string. Um, you can have open and closed bosonic strings, of course. Uh, the previous question about introducing fermions leads to the superstring, but within the superstring, there's even more choices. So there's so-called type 2A and type 2B strings. Those are theories of supersymmetric closed strings. Um, then there's a type 1 string, which is oriented and open string. And then there's the heterotic string theory, um, which is also, well... It, it has open strings. I should say every theory of open strings necessarily also has closed strings, but a theory of closed strings need not necessarily have open strings. So 2A and 2B have closed but not open. Heterotic has open strings. 
and therefore closed strings. Um, and those are all different different uh, types of string theories with different properties. So you might say, okay, it sounds like you just have a huge collection of different string theories. Are any of them like preferred or are they all different? I mean, it seems like a zoo or something like that. Um, but it's believed that all of these string theories are equivalent. They're all different ways of describing the same underlying theory. Uh, and they're related by certain dualities. So one of the dualities we discussed already before is this T-duality. So T-duality relates a theory on a large circle to a theory on a small circle. But then there's other dualities. There is so-called S-duality um, of type 2B string theory, um, which relates certain solutions to other solutions where um, the formal statement is that you perform an SL2Z modular transformation on the complex axiodiloton. There's a bunch of buzzwords or something, but um, the picture to keep in mind is it relates one solution to another. So in your head, you should think of this map of all these different string theories and then a collection of, you know, arrows connecting them, different dualities that say this is actually equivalent to this, this is actually equivalent to this. So they're all related by some complicated web of dualities and equivalences. A little bit like Langlands in math, many different math areas all related by certain connections or something. Um, anyway, that's the way to think about it. Okay, well, I'm out of questions. I don't know if anybody else has any. K-Star is typing, but he, he probably not a question. It's probably just a response to the chat. But we'll see, I guess. Oh, yeah, he's it's, showing the it it's just like, yeah. yeah. Talking about M theory. I don't know. Um, if there's no question, can I ask a follow-up question of the previous question I asked? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, yeah, so you were telling me about the application of non-abelian duality uh, for, like, uh, you know, in generating the type two solution technique. So, can you like tell me more about that? Oh, as a solution generating technique? Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. It's uh, it's similar to the way you would use the usual abelian t duality as a solution generating technique. So, so what do I mean, solution generating technique? Um, if you didn't know any string theory, if you were just a gravity person, so you just, all you do in life is you uh, solve the Einstein equations with a particular stress energy tensor and try to write down the metric and values for the fields uh, that solve that equation. If you were that sort of person, um, you might find it very interesting if I just tell you, hey, for any solution of the 10 dimensional Einstein equations with particular stress energy, associated with the, the massless fields of string theory, you can take any solution and turn this crank by applying the Buescher rules, and it'll give you some other solution. Uh, that's what I mean by a solution generating technique. You apply these rules and take in some solution and get another solution. Then the gravity person would probably find this very interesting. He doesn't care that this comes from string theory, but he could say, oh, great. I'll just take the solution that I know and like and perform some series of steps and get a different solution. Uh, so for instance, one one solution generating chain, which I've used um, in previous projects is you, I mean, this is an 11 dimensional example. You take a solution to 11 dimensional supergravity, which is an approximation to M theory. You come down on a circle, you dimensionally reduce to get a 10 dimensional solution. Then you T dualize that solution to get some other 10 dimensional solution over here. Then you do a diffeomorphism in this 10 dimensional solution, which is like a twist. Then you T dualize to another solution, T dualize again, after the twist, and then you lift or oxidize that solution back up to M theory, back up to 11 dimensions. People sometimes call this a TST transformation for TST, meaning T duality, the shift, which is the diffeomorphism and another T duality. Um, so it's a complicated chain of steps that map solutions to solutions. But at the end of the day, the output of this procedure is some highly non-trivial solution to the equations of motion for 11 dimensional supergravity, which you never would have guessed um, just by trying to solve them directly. It's like this solution generating technique gives you some like magical new solution you wouldn't have known about. And uh, people use this to great effect in all sorts of contexts. Um, TT bar, for instance, has been argued to be a TST transformation by Wei Song and Louis Apollo, although their first paper had uh, an error in it, which uh, I can tell you about. Um, but anyway, so that's, I mean, 
that applies just as well to the abelian and non-abelian T-duality context. So if, for instance, you're studying solutions of 10-dimensional string theory on, say, ADS5 cross S5, so a five-dimensional anti-dissider space with negative curvature and a five-dimensional sphere with a positive curvature that's correlated with ADS curvature, um, if you start with some solution to that thing, then you can do a non-abelian T-duality along a direction of the sphere, the S5, to get some other solution, which, again, you may not have guessed. Um, and people, especially these integrability people, um, people who, like, at ETH, a lot of people in Europe do this integrability stuff, but a lot of those integrability people like to use non-abelian T-dualities to generate new solutions of the supergravity equations that have some nice interpretation from integrability, right? This is, um, yeah, uh, this, uh, uh, what's his name? It just went out of my head. Uh, Gabardiel, Matthias Gabardiel, who was one of the early people in ADS integrability. Um, people like that use these, these sorts of techniques. So anyway, another long-winded answer, but that's what I mean when I say using T-duality as a solution generating technique. It's generating new solutions to gravity equations motivated by T-duality and string theory. So, uh, like, after obtaining the new kind of solutions, so physically we obtain the new kind of states as well? Oh, sorry, could you say the last part again? Physically you obtain what? We, we, do we obtain the new physical states as well? Uh, you know? Yeah, I mean, you could think of it as a state. I mean, this is all classical. It's a new solution to um, essentially the Einstein equations. So, if you think of that solution as a state, then indeed it's generating a new physical state. Um, I don't know if I would call it a state, though. Normally I think of state as something quantum mechanical, like a state lives in a Hilbert space. This is generating a new classical solution to right. the Einstein equations. Yeah. Okay. So, so uh, the solution, uh, the, the new solution, so we obtain the other, like the, the solutions in the dual form of the, uh, you know, after applying the pusher. Uh, rules, right? Yeah, that's right. So, I mean, it's, it's, I mean, concretely take a solution for metric and matter fields, apply Boucher rules, get some other solution at the end, and then that new solution at the end is the output of this procedure. So, it, it gives you a new solution to the Einstein equations, um, which people like. Do we just uh, have the Boucher chases yeah. only, or uh, do we have something else, like uh, other kinds of the rules uh, you know, from which we cannot obtain the rules? Uh, sorry, what was the first part? You're asking, what are the Boucher rules? Uh, or are there other uh, rules? Yeah, I, I did just the Boucher rules only to obtain the new solutions uh, for the dual part, or do we have something else as well um, in the literature? Well, I mean, if you're just doing T-dualities, then yes, you would just use the Boucher rules. Um, but for these more complicated chains of dualities, you would use a combination of ingredients. So for the TST, you use Boucher rules. Then for the shift, the intermediate step, you do a diffeomorphism. So it's just a change of coordinates mixing in some way. And then you use Boucher rules to get back. So in that case, you use two ingredients, Boucher rules and diffs. But there are more complicated chains. So you can also do S-dualities. There's an analog of the Boucher rules for S-dualities, which tell you how do I replace all of the fields that give a solution to type 2b supergravity with different values for the fields that represent the S-dual frame? So you could do that. Then there's other rules for dimensional reduction and dimensional lifting that tell you how do I take an 11-dimensional solution and come down to 10 or vice versa. So for these more general uh, duality chains or solution generating techniques, the ingredients you would apply are Boucher rules, diffeomorphisms, S-duality rules, and potentially dimensional reduction of lifting. And that gives you much more freedom with all these ingredients to do interesting stuff. Um, while, there, while, you were, while you were answering that, there was a stream of questions in the chat, which I might as well read out. So firstly, it was uh, my question was, what is M-theory? Okay. <clears throat> uh, so that's... Uh, <laughs> the the honest answer is we don't know what it is yet. Um, the the slightly less honest answer is that um, all of the ten dimensional string theories I described can be thought of as limits of some eleven dimensional theory called M theory. The way to think about this roughly is that 
one of the string theories type 2a has a parameter, a coupling constant called the string coupling. And that it's a real valued parameter. Um, and what you can do is you can roughly say, I will now view that real valued parameter in type 2a as the radius of some circle. So I'm going to declare this parameter in my theory now as a geometrical interpretation as the radius of some circle. If you do that, your 10 dimensional theory now becomes 11 dimensional because the circle is an extra dimension. Um, and then you ask, okay, what 11 dimensional theory would correspond to that description, even if the 11th dimension were not a circle? Just, is there a theory there? And the answer is yes, there is a theory there. There is a unique 11 dimensional maximally supersymmetric theory called M theory. It's not a theory of strings. The degrees of freedom in M theory are the M2 brain and the M5 brain. Brain is short for membrane. So whereas a string is a one-dimensional object, it's extended along just one length dimension, the two brain is a two spatial dimensional object, and the five brain is a five spatial dimensional object, and those are the degrees of freedom of M theory. And we know that the low energy limit of M theory is another theory called 11-dimensional supergravity. So you can study M theory in that limit by using supergravity, um, which is very nice because we happen to know that 11 is the largest number of dimensions in which you can have a supergravity theory. <laughs> so there's something very special and unique here, right? The, the one unique theory that reduces to all of the string theories happens to have as its low energy limit the supergravity theory in the largest number of dimensions where you could ever have one. So, I mean, that's a very beautiful story. These things all connect in a very non-trivial way. Um, so anyway, that, that, that's that's the brief introduction. So that, that's why people talk about approximations to M theory then, because it's just the things that M theory reduces to, right? Yeah, that's right. I mean, you could think of all these string theories as different limits of M theory. So, I mean, you can take a low energy limit of M theory and it's supergravity, or you can take M theory and compactify on a circle, and now it's uh, type 2a. You can take M theory and compactify on a torus, and that, and that will be equivalent to reducing type 2b on a circle. There's like all these stories. Um, there's also an F theory. F theory is uh, kind of like a 12 dimensional theory. It's not really a 12 dimensional theory. It, F theory is like taking type 2b string theory and trying to play a similar game, right? How did we go from 2a to m theory? We said, look, 2a has a parameter. I'm going to view that parameter as basically a, a geometrical quantity associated with the circle. That lets me lift to 11. You can go to type 2b where there's a natural parameter tau that you can view as something describing a torus. And then you say, oh, I'm going to try to lift my 10-dimensional theory to 12 dimensions by geometrizing that parameter and saying, now I have an extra torus. Um, that procedure gives you F theory. But F theory isn't an honest 12 dimensional theory. It's kind of a bookkeeping device for thinking about this torus parameter in a 10 dimensional theory. So F theory is less fundamental in a sense. M theory is an honest 11 dimensional supersymmetric theory that exists. So, um, but yeah, to your question, yes, all of these things can be viewed. What? 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 What does F stand for? What does F stand for? Good question. You have to ask uh, Kumran Vafa. I think um, he never officially said what oh. the F and F theory stands for, but unofficially people think F stands for father theory, um, kind of by analogy. If you think M stands for mother theory, the mother of all theories, the F is the father theory. Uh, that's not official. Or is it not M matrix? Is it not matrix, he said? M. Yeah, yeah, M and that, that M stands for matrix, right? No, there's no official name. Like when Witten came oh, up, okay. there's no official name for what M stands for. You can think of M as mother. You can think of M as matrix if you like. There are matrix theory representations of M theory. If you do this DLCQ, the so-called discrete light cone quantization, as they call it, um, you can think of M theory as a certain matrix theory. Um, but I don't think no one has officially said, oh, the M and M theory stands for this. I mean, it's, uh, you can, it's uh, like whatever okay. Yeah. okay. Um, this is probably going to take, going to be a long answer, but, um, our cat then afterwards asked, what really is TT bar? Oh, yeah, this is uh, a very different question. Um, TT bar is, 
a way of deforming two-dimensional field theories. So, um, so Josh didn't mention this in his talk, but there's an equivalent way to think about this um, Nambu-Gotu or Polyakov action as saying, oh, well, the string, right, the string is extended in space and it moves through time. So it sweeps out some curtain in space-time, right? So it's a two-dimensional object when you imagine both its spatial extent and its passage through time. So it's a two-dimensional object. That means we can think of string theory as a two-dimensional field theory. It's uh, a theory that lives on the two-dimensional world sheet of the string. Um, and it happens to be a very special type of two-dimensional theory called the conformal field theory, which means it's invariant under certain rescalings of the metric, the Ramanian metric on this manifold. Um, okay, great. So in any two-dimensional th field theory, like a conformal one, there's a stress tensor, which Josh also mentioned. The world sheet stress tensor here vanishes, but for other two-dimensional theories, the stress tensor does not need to vanish. Um, it will be a two-by-two two matrix in a two-dimensional field theory, um, T mu nu, if you like. And you can take the determinant of that two-by-two two matrix. That's a thing you're allowed to do. Um, now you ask the question, which sounds very strange. What happens if I take a two-dimensional field theory and I write its Lagrangian, like the Nambu Gotu Lagrangian Josh wrote down, but I deform it. So by deform it, I mean take the Lagrangian, add to it the determinant of the stress energy tensor for that theory. Seems like a very weird thing to do. It's um, not very well motivated. But if you do this, something extremely strange happens. Um, this adding the determinant defines a one parameter family of theories. So it's like a flow in the space of field theories, starting from some initial condition. And all of the theories along that one parameter family are under extremely good analytic control. By that I mean I can calculate, I can write down answers to questions in those deformed theories. Um, so that's already surprising. Now, for the final surprise in this whole story about TT bar, um, you could ask, okay, what if I take the simplest two-dimensional theory I can think of, a free boson? So like uh, essentially this Polyakov action where you set the metric to flat. So what if I just take a free boson and I deform it by this TT bar? and I solve the flow equation. What do I get? <laughs> the answer is you solve this flow equation and you get exactly the number go to action that Josh showed us. So the TT bar deformation of a free theory is the number go to action, which tells you TT bar is generating string theory in some sense from a simpler theory, from a free scalar. Um, so that's why people became interested in TT bar starting in 2016, its connection to string theory. But despite the fact that we've been thinking about it very hard for the past six years, we still don't have a good understanding of what a TT bar deformed theory is. It's something very mysterious. It looks like a string theory. It doesn't quite act like the string theories we already understand. So it seems like something new. It's like a string theory. It's a little like a local quantum field theory. It's not really either of them, but it's some new kind of structure that we need to understand better. Um, so that's, that's what I've been working on doing is trying to understand that better. Uh, does TT bar deformation fall into like quantum integrability part or what is it like? Yes. I mean, in terms of integrability. Very good. Yeah. I mean, it's, um, well, first of all, I should, I should hedge that you can TT bar deform any theory. Doesn't have to be conformal. Doesn't have to be integrable. You can do it to any theory. But with that in mind, you could ask, what happens if I TT bar deform an integrable theory? Classically integrable, quantum integrable, doesn't matter. Um, TT bar deforming an integrable theory preserves the integrability. So if you like, if you're just an integrable field theory person, you don't care about string theory or any of this crap, you should still be interested in TT bar because you can view it as a black box that takes in an integrable theory and spits out another integrable theory. And those, I mean, such a thing is extremely rare, right? I mean, it, it, integrable theories are highly special. So um, the fact that you can do that should be a huge surprise. Um, to an integrable field theorist. And um, I think that was Zamolodzikov's motivation. In 2004, when TT bar was discovered by Zamolodzikov, um, he's coming at it from kind of the integrability perspective, and that's probably why he wanted to study this operator to begin with. Um, so, yeah, for sure, that's, that's a big reason to care about this. I'm still recording. Greg wants to make his views skyrocket, he says. Indeed. 
Okay. So, well, Greg, since you're keeping track of the questions, um, instead of reading all of these, I'll just let you pick whichever question to do next if there's more. Or if people need to leave, of course, they can leave. Oh. But. Um, that was... Question from Homotype, which uh, I'm curious to hear your answer on, I guess, uh, which was, uh, do you think TT bar is the future of physics? Um, I don't know if I'd say future of physics. I don't know what the, the future of physics is, but it's, um, it's definitely something that connects a lot of fields and deserves more investigation, right? I mean, um, part of the reason why TT bar is exciting is that it unites a lot of different communities. So as we just described, integrability, people care about it. String theory and brain people, brain type people care about it. Um, one of my past papers shows that there's an interesting connection between string theory and so-called non-linearly realized symmetries and spontaneous symmetry breaking. So that's of interest to a totally different community. Um, and it has connections to amplitudes. People have studied scattering amplitudes, all of these amplitude type people like Nima, Arkani Hamed, and Yaroslav, and people like that, coming from a completely different community, can be interested in string theory from the amplitudes perspective. Um, the gravity people are interested in, interested in string theory because um, you can find versions of 10-dimensional solutions to gravity equations that represent TT-bar-like deformed theories. So it touches a lot of different fields. So although maybe I wouldn't say future of physics per se, that's a very uh, lofty descriptor to use, I wouldn't say that, but um, I definitely think we're going to learn a lot from it. It's, it's going to give a very interesting direction for, for lots of different uh, investigations of different questions. That's for sure. And uh, now uh, people are asking what happens if you TT bar different things. Oh, what are the different things? Um, Otium said, what happens if you TT bar deform a string theory itself? <laughs> and Jake asked what happens when we TT bar deform topological field theories. Very good, both very good questions. Um, the first one, TT bar deforming string theory, no one has answered that yet, but I'm working on it with Mukund right now, actually. So we have some results. Um, the First of all, you have to answer what do you mean by even TT bar deforming string theory, right? Because um, if, you, if you recognize string theory, if you represent it, as the Polyakov action, with which Josh showed us, um, there's bosons in a metric, and when you quantize it, you have to play one of these games, like old covariant quantization, or light cone, or BRST, um, and then depending on which of those ways you quantize it, it will affect how you define a notion of a TT bar deformed string theory. So what Mukin and I are doing right now, and we're hoping to write up within the next few months, is let's quantize string theory using BRST ghosts. So this is different from what Josh showed us, but there's a way to um, gauge fix diffeomorphisms for the string by taking the scalars that Josh showed us and then adding into it these fictitious fields, these B and C ghosts, which are, they're weird. They're anti-commuting quantities. They're Grossman quantities, but they're scalars, which is weird because you would say, how could you have such a thing? That violates the spin statistics theorem. Spin statistics tells me that bosons or scalars have to be commuting quantities. Fermions have to be anti-commuting quantities. How can you have an anti-commuting scalar? doesn't make sense. Um, and that's true. It doesn't make sense, but they're not physical fields. They're just a bookkeeping device for gauge-fixing diffeomorphisms. So um, if you do that, a beautiful story emerges. This is probably the most elegant way to quantize the string with ghosts, because you can write down this so-called BRST operator, QB, built out of the ghost fields, and it's nil potent. It squares to zero. QB squared is zero. Now, as soon as I say something squares to zero, Greg is probably chomping at the bit to say, oh, oh there's a cohomology here. <laughs> uh, and there is. I am. Um, so when you define this QB that squares to zero, you say, okay, what is the cohomology of this BRST operator? <laughs> um, and the answer is the um, closed forms mod exact forms with respect to QB are the physical states of the string. So that's beautiful because before with old covariant quantization that Josh showed us to get to the physical strength, physical states, you have to go through this extremely involved procedure where you impose virasoro constraints, you find you know, all of this, you have to fix all these parameters, 
by demanding that negative norm states decouple, it's very involved. If you do the ghosts, it's immediate. The physical states are the ones that are cohomology classes with respect to QB, which is beautiful. Um, okay, so there's nothing new in what I just told you. That's all been known for decades. Um, <laughs> now, what do you, what happens if you TT bar deform string theory realized as bosons plus BR, B, uh, BC ghosts? And the beautiful result that we've proven is that the TT bar operator of this theory is a BRST exact object. What does that mean? TT bar equals QB of something. It's BRST exact. Um, but what does that mean? I mean, in, in cohomology, we mod out by exact forms. So in a particular sense, if you TT bar deform string theory, you're doing nothing. You're adding an exact operator, which is something you mod out by. So it's equivalent to zero. That sounds a little weird because it sounds like, why is it that if you TT bar deform, you're doing nothing? But if you think about it for a moment, it actually makes perfect sense because Josh showed us early in his slides, he said the interpretation of the world sheet equation of motion is that the world sheet stress tensor vanishes, right? He had the sentence saying world sheet stress tensor is zero. This is not to imply that the target space stress tensor is zero for the string propagating in space time, but the world sheet stress tensor is zero. So now it makes perfect sense. The world sheet stress tensor is zero. So its determinant is certainly zero. And therefore, it makes sense that TT bar will be a BRST exact operator. It's something you mod out by. So the, the result of this paper that we're writing up will show you a nice cohomological way to understand why TT bar deforming string theory is really doing nothing. And that's, that's the nice thing. Um, what was the second question? If you deform a topological... Oh. It was, um, yeah, let me find it. Yeah. What happens when we TT bar deform topological field theories? Yeah, good. So I have another paper on this. <laughs> this is giving me a good opportunity to plug all of my papers. Um, let's pick a specific example. What's your favorite topological field theory? Well, mine is 3D transcendence. So what happens if you try to TT bar deform 3D transcendence? Um, it's topological. So it's independent of the metric. The stress tensor is defined as the functional derivative with respect to the metric, which is zero. So it looks like it's doing nothing. Um, TT bar should be trivial for a topological field theory. Then you say, well, I don't want it to be trivial. Can I do something else which makes it non-trivial to try to save it so that this story isn't, isn't just uh, junk? Um, the answer is yes. The thing which, which we studied and proposed doing in, the, in this case is to say, um, take your topological field theory in three dimensions, say Chern-Simons. We know that that thing will generally, by some bulk boundary correspondence, be dual um, to some two-dimensional theory on the boundary of the 3D space-time. So for instance, if you do U1 Chern-Simons on upper half plane cross time, we know that's dual to a chiral boson. This is explained in David Tong's notes. It's dual to a chiral boson on the boundary, so the line cross time. Or in other examples, for ADS3 gravity, written in Chern-Simons variables by ADS-CFT, that's dual to some two-dimensional field theory, blah, 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 blah. In every example, the 3D Chern-Simons will be dual to a 2D theory on the boundary. Okay. That 2D field theory is not topological. So TT bar deformed that. Do the usual TT bar deformation of the 2D boundary theory. Then invert the question and ask, what have you done to the 3D topological field theory such that the TT bar deformation of the boundary theory emerges as a consequence. That is what I propose we should take as the definition of the TT bar deformation of a topological field theory. Deform the boundary theory and then invert the question and ask what deformation of the topological bulk did you need to do to get that? And the answer which we found at least for SL2 turn Simons for its dimensional reduction to 2DDF theory and all these other realizations is that the TT bar deformation of the topological field theory is a particular change in boundary conditions. It's changing the, the sort of polarization, if you like, of the Trans-Simons gauge field near infinity or near the boundary. So like usually you fix a polarization for Trans-Simons. If you're doing like holomorphic quantization, you say, I have a Z and a Z bar, I have an AZ, AZ bar, A bar Z, A bar Z bar. And you say, I'm going to choose a polarization so that AZ bar is zero. So A is holomorphic, it only has an AZ piece. Um, if you TT bar deform, it mixes. So it changes your polarization 
so that even though you were holomorphic in the undeformed theory, you're no longer purely holomorphic in the deformed theory. That's what I mean by TT bar deforming a topological theory. And by the way, if you read Victor's paper, Victor Pai, who's a math PhD student here, the project I mentioned in the server, where he was working with Kevin Costello, um, he showed that that definition that I just said, that we like very much, of a TT bar deformation can be realized as a particular construction in four-dimensional churn Simons. So this 4D churn Simons theory that Costello, Ed Witten, and friends invented, that theory can be used to generate TT bar um, through a very elegant construction. So, um, so anyway, it's, it's a, again, a long-winded answer, but um, the short version is yes. I have a way of, you know, a, a definition of TT bar for topological field theory, and it seems to be an interesting one because it's related to Costello and Ed and all this other stuff that people do. That's the upshot. Uh, so what happens if we TT bar deform the WCW model? Oh, good. Yeah. So that um, you, can, uh, yeah. You, can write down, you can write down the answer. It's been done. Um, I think the first time uh, the WCW was TT bar deformed was in the paper by Benelli in like 2018 or 2019. Okay. Um, so you get something, you can write down the deformed classical Lagrangian, uh, for the, the WCW. Um, it hasn't been studied in great detail. Um, we know the classical Lagrangian, but people haven't really probed any finer grained properties of the TT bar deformed theory, the way that they have in other examples, like for deforming a free boson. Um, but you get something, the, the example that's better understood, um, so if you dimensionally reduce, okay, so for people who don't know, um, a WCW model is, WCW is for Wessamina Witten. This is a two-dimensional field theory um, that you can think of as kind of a field defined on a two-dimensional space that is group valued. So it takes values in some group and the action is like some trace G inverse DG where G is the group element roughly plus some other chunk. Um, so it's some group field theory. Um, you can deform it, you can TT bar deform it. Um, the properties of the deformed theory have not been studied in great detail, but I can tell you something I have studied in great detail is if you dimensionally reduce the WCW model, so come down from two dimensions to one dimension, that theory is now a, part of, uh, a theory of a particle, a particle moving on a group. So at each time, the particle has some position on your group manifold, Lie group, so NSP continuous, particle on a group. Um, that one-dimensional particle on a group theory is dual to a two-dimensional BF theory, BF is a type of gauge theory. Um, and you can understand the TT bar deformation of the dimensionally reduced thing where I'm able to write down the exact deformation. So I can write down the solution to the dimensionally reduced TT bar for the particle on a group. And I'm able to write down the exact change in boundary conditions for the BF theory that it's dual to that implements that change in the, um, in the particle on a group. So that was studied in my paper with Stephen on Wilson lines and things like that. So um, anyway, the short answer to your question is you can deform WCW. It's been written down. It hasn't been studied too much, but the simpler version where you dimensionally reduce has been studied a lot uh, by me. So th that's something. You can do. <laughs> uh, okay. There's more questions. Uh, I'll, I'll ask the question that Homotope had for Josh. It's quite a, uh, something that maybe even the viewers would be interested in too is um if you uh if you had to I'll, I'll say if you were to do another talk what would it be on um probably topological quantum field theory or something more math oriented i was thinking about doing elliptic cohomology Okay, cool. Yeah, you said elliptic homology, and I think also in DM you mentioned you were reading about topological strings at some point, which is also fun. Uh, also for Josh, I'm curious, how did you get sort of interested in this so early, right? I mean, it, it seems like uh, you sort of sought out string theory readings and stuff like that on your own and just sort of went in that direction. So did this emerge from you were interested in some other area of math and it connected to string theory, or were you interested in string theory for its own sake and just started reading about it, or... Uh, how did you get into this? I was just interested for my...
Did he cut out? Did, any, did, did is it just no, 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 no. I'm not hearing anything. I think it was just cut out. Yeah, I heard I'm interested for my, and then I lost him. Same. Yeah, I still still didn't hear it, I guess. I don't know if we lost him or not. Yeah, no. I don't know if it's cutting out or if it just kind of ran for a moment. Yeah. The unforeseen circumstances. Yeah, it was also cutting out a bit during the talk um, in certain parts. I mean, yeah. not most of it, but okay. some sentences got cut off. He's typing now. I uh, started studying it by own sake. Yeah. And during the talk, it wasn't too bad, though. Uh, we had slides as well, so it was fine. Uh, yeah, also there was a, that, I was about to ask that, um, K-Star had a question about TT bar in ADS3. Does it produce it? Interesting. Um, so, so what do we mean exactly? So TT bar deforming, um, a field theory on ADS3 or TT bar deforming ADS3 gravity, um, at, at like holographically to some 2D field theory or, or what exactly? There's many ways to combine ADS with TT bar. So, I just want to clarify what exactly he meant. Okay, you might just want to read the chat, I guess. He's, uh, yeah. Yeah, so ADS3 CFT. Oh, okay, so yeah, so then uh, this, yeah, this question is essentially if you TT bar deforms the 2D conformal field theory due to three dimensional ADS gravity, what have you done from the perspective of the 3D bulk? Um, so one answer to that is what we said before about if you write the ADS3 gravity theory in Schrodinger's Simons variables and deform the bulk or the boundary, what you've done in the bulk is a particular change in the polarization for the Schrodinger's Simons variables. That's one way of seeing it. You can also see this in the metric formalism. So usually when you study ADS3 gravity to get a good variational principle, what you do is add some so-called Brown-York boundary term so that when you add this term, um, it essentially is needed to, to uh, impose that you, in your variational principle, you hold fixed the metric at the conformal boundary, um, but not its radial derivatives. That's some variational principle you can do. Um, so the, the, t, the, the interpretation of TT bar deforming is that you change what you mean by the metric that's being held fixed. So you no longer hold fixed the metric itself as you go to infinity, but you hold fixed a particular combination of the metric and its radial derivatives, which is a very weird thing to do. Um, it's changing what you mean by the source and expectation value, as they're called, in the holographic dictionary, um, so that kind of in the new variables, what you call the metric is like a mixture of what you used to call the metric and what you used to call the stress tensor. This is a very bizarre thing to do. Um, but that's the interpretation from the ADS3 side of doing TT bar, at least for the good sign. Now, I should say there's one other proposal which I don't like. Um, this is by Herman Verlinda and uh, McGough and some other people um, where they claimed that deforming by TT bar for the so-called bad sign, lambda negative, they want to interpret as saying, oh, you're doing the usual ADS CFT where your, your ADS space time is uh, non-compact. It goes off to infinity. But now you're bringing it in so that it gets cut off at a finite radius. <laughs> so you put your ADS3 gravity theory in a box, uh, a spherical box, I guess. So it ends at some finite radius r, and then after that, the, the space time's cut off. Um, that's the one interpretation people use. I dislike that for many reasons. One, it's for the bad sign of TT bar, where by bad sign, I mean when you deform with lambda negative, the deformed theory has energy levels that become complex when you go to higher and higher states. And complex energies just don't make any sense. Um, so that's already bad. The second issue is that it's widely believed that it doesn't make sense to put quantum gravity in a box to impose a finite radial cutoff um, for various reasons. I mean, roughly speaking, um, if you try to put gravity in a box, the graviton wants to fluctuate at the location of the cutoff at the box, so you can't hold it there. You can't keep the gravity in the box because of the, the fluctuations. So this has never been proved, but I mean, Ed has said this, you know, in informal discussions to people for years that he believes it's just impossible to do quantum gravity at finite cutoff. So 
That's another reason to believe that this other proposal that TT bar is putting gravity in a box should not make sense. So I don't think it makes sense. Stephen, my <laughs> collaborator, seems to believe it does make sense. So he has a paper with Eric Krauss, his PhD advisor, about these boundary gravitons and ADS3 gravity in a box and blah, 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 blah. So he seems more optimistic that the theory makes sense, but I think it's probably crap. Uh, that's my perspective. So I would use other, other interpretations of PT bar for in ADS rather than that. Uh, let me see what else there is. Um, there was that. There was a question by Homotope, which was uh, apparently you and he were discussing about E eight theory. He was wondering your thoughts on that. No, that's just shit. This guy's um, this guy's a crank. Um, so for those, okay. um, I will contextualize this for <laughs> people. There's this um, there's this Garrett Lisi guy. I'll drop his name. Um, if you have not heard of him, I'll drop it in the discussion chat. But there's, there's this guy, this Garrett Lisi. Um, so he was in academia, then he left, and then he um, started claiming this like crank theory that um, you can combine um, all interactions with gravity using the group E8. Um, and E8 is great, by the way. There's nothing wrong with using E8. Um, it, I mean, it occurs in the heterotic string as one of the allowed gauge groups or something, but um, it's just wrong. Everything he's doing is conclusively wrong. I mean, there's been, there was a paper as early as 2009, which I'll drop in the chat, where they just showed, I mean, Jacques Dissler's a serious guy. I, I mean, I trust his results in this paper. I mean, he just proved, not even using physics, just from pure math, that any sort of theory you want to embed in E8 and the way that Garrett wants to do it is just not going to make sense. I mean, he proved it very carefully. It doesn't make any sense. So, I mean... That's just crap. And you should have known it's crap when you read that this guy, Garrett Lisi, is like an independent researcher with no academic affiliation. Like he just literally lives somewhere on the beach and goes surfing and uh, writes this crap in his free time. So he, he's just a crank. <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, so uh, what are you, you like, uh, can you tell us like, briefly what are general geometries and uh, so the question was about generalized geometry, you said? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Generalized so you're thinking, geometries. You're thinking about like double geometry, like T-duality invariant, um, double geometry. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah, I can talk about that. Yeah. yeah, it seems that you're very interested in T-duality. Uh, yeah, so this, this <laughs> double yeah. geometry thing, um, this is a way people try to make this T-duality that we talked about manifest. So... One thing Josh did not tell us is that when you quantize the string, um, the massless sector of the string universally has um, a metric for the target space, the G, an anti-symmetric two-form, B, sometimes called the Kolb-Ramon field or the NS2 form, and a dilaton. And those things mix under T-duality. So something people have tried to do, which has often been fruitful in physics, when you have some symmetry, you try to geometrize it, right? If you have diffeomorphism symmetry, you try to geometrize it and you get general relativity. If you have supersymmetry, you try to geometrize it and you get superspace. This thing seems to be a good way of handling symmetries. So people said, can we geometrize T-duality? Um, can we write down a geometric structure under which the Buescher rules that mix G and B is kind of manifest? And this is something that Barton Zwiebach worked on for some time, by the way. Um, it's hard to do this because you want to combine two objects, say the metric and the B fields, into one object, but G is a symmetric tensor as a metric, B is an anti-symmetric tensor as a two-form. So it's a little weird. Um, so what people try to do is this kind of double geometry where you, rather than having, say, D target space coordinates, you double it to have 2D target space coordinates, so it's twice as big, and you package the metric and B field into some strange object that acts like a generalized metric on this larger space. Um, and it becomes very messy very quickly because now you have to ask, well, the natural sorts of derivatives I would think of as, gener uh, as generating a gauge transformation for the metric, like a diff, is the Lie derivative. So like Li, Xi, if Xi is some vector field, Li, Xi of something, um, is like a Lie derivative with respect to the metric, um, which generates a diff. And the thing which generates a gauge transformation for B is B goes to B plus D lambda. 
for some one form lambda. So you're led to try to combine those into some geometrical object that has a, both a, a lead derivative and a shift by a, an exact one form in it. And if you try to do that, it leads to this mathematical object called a current algebroid, which is like some strange bracket derivative type structure that's supposed to generate transformations for both metric and B field. So as you push more and more into this generalized geometry thing, it seems that things get mathematically more and more hairy. And I mean, there are some results that are kind of cute and interesting in this field. But my impression is that broadly, the consensus in the community seems to be that this double geometry and manifest t-duality invariance is um, kind of uh, stagnated. It's not uh, an area that has a lot more progress in it because it gets very messy and it's not clear how to proceed. So for instance, Emil Martinek at U Chicago, um, who I spoke to about this, I mean, his view is that th this idea is crap. You should not try to do it. Um, should not try to geometrize t-duality because t-duality is not like an ordinary symmetry, like diffeomorphism symmetry. Diffeomorphism symmetry is a symmetry that maps one configuration in a theory to a different configuration in the same theory. Emil's view is that t-duality maps a configuration for one theory to a configuration in a different theory. So it's, a, it's not the ordinary type of symmetry, and you should not try to geometrize it. This double geometry, he thinks, is kind of a red herring that you shouldn't really do. Um, not everyone would agree with that, but I think it's fair to say that double geometry is not like a really hot topic, and these generalized geometry things are kind of, uh, I don't know, they seem to be a little stuck, is what I would say. Okay, uh, let me see if I, there's, I think there were other questions. Uh, let me see if I can find them all. There was uh, there was some question by Homotope like oh like fifteen minutes ago, which I didn't ask about Chern Simons. Uh, let me see if there's anything more recent as well. But okay, no. Uh, I'll let you. Mark. Oh wait, no. Um. K star has just asked, what is root TT bar exactly? <laughs> Good question. Um, root TT bar is an op. Well, I was recently asked who is the inventor of root TT bar um, in a group conversation, and Stephen said, Chris is. And I, was, I said, okay, well, okay. Tech, it was co discovered okay. by me and a group of Iranians around the same time, and the Iranians may or may not have invented this or blah, blah, blah. So, um, uh, it's several. So anyway, the statement is that root TT bar is a variant of TT bar that um, I, I thought about in a, in a previous project, um, which the name comes from the fact that classically, the way you attempt to define this deformation is by taking a, a particular linear combination of um, objects built from the stress tensor, not the thing that would normally be TT bar, but a different one. You take that combination and then you take the square root of it which is a very strange thing to do because, I mean, at the quantum level, you can't take the square root of a local operator. It's generally not something that you could do. I mean, despite the fact that a year ago, Cyan told me it's trivial, we take square roots of operators all the time, you're an idiot for saying you can't do this because he was thinking of matrices. I'm not talking about square roots of matrices. I'm, taking, I'm talking about taking a square root of a local operator. Um, in general, that's not something you can do. So it is not yet known whether the root TT bar deformation is consistent and well-defined and gives a, a quantum deformation, but we can still study it classically. So what I showed in this paper that proposed this root TT bar deformation is that classically, the deformation driven by this operator is under extremely good control, similar to the usual TT bar operator. So for example, there's a four-dimensional theory of electromagnetism called MOTMAX that was invented by uh, Bondo, Sorokin, um, some people years ago, ModMax is short for modified Maxwell. So this is a theory which is like the ordinary Maxwell theory of electro, uh, electromagnetism, modified in some way, but modified in a very nice way, which preserves conformal invariance and preserves electromagnetic duality invariance. Beautiful theory. Dimensionally reduce that 4D theory to two dimensions. This gives you a theory of scalars in two dimensions, which is modified in a similar way. In my paper, I proved that that modified scalar theory in two dimensions is what you get 
if you do this root TT bar deformation of a collection of free scalars. So that's already kind of nice. We also proved that this root TT bar deformation classically commutes with the regular TT bar deformation. Now, a commuting square of deformations in the category of quantum field theories is a very rare thing to find. Um, you would normally expect nothing to commute like this. So that's also nice. Um, and then we had some other observations that this deformation is classically marginal. It exactly preserves tracelessness of the stress tensor. So um, all sorts of stuff. So the short answer to your question is root TT bar is a speculative deformation, which has been studied and shown to be nice classically and which has not yet been proved to make sense at the quantum level. But if it does make sense at the quantum level, then one would hope that this could open up many, many questions, many lines of research, because then you could basically repeat all of the interesting analyses that have been done for TT bar, but for root TT bar and see what you get. And then that would be very nice. Anyway, Homotope has lost question privileges, he says. <laughs> yeah. Uh, K-star is typing, but mm, I think that's it for the questions so far, unless K-star comes up with a banger. Um, Picture of <laughs> Somewhat random image, but okay. Okay. Generalized to a cube root TT bar, he asks. Yeah, so uh, in two dimensions, probably not. We thought about this a little bit in higher dimensions. You might try to take a particular combination of scalars built from the stress tensors, the stress tensor in three dimensions, and then take its cube root. Um, I played around with that in Mathematica for about a week to see if you get anything nice. And it looks like you don't, which I don't really understand. Um, it doesn't seem to generalize to higher dimensions in an obvious way. So, for instance, I could not engineer um, any cube root TT bar type object in three dimensions, which would generate a theory like Modmax or the modified scalar theory um, in three dimensions. I don't know why, to be honest. Um, it might just be that certain numbers of dimensions are special for TT and root TT type deformations. So for instance, four dimensions seems to be very special for TT and root TT uh, for gauge fields. So deforming gauge theories in four dimensions gives you beautiful results with TT and root TT. Deforming scalars in two dimensions also seems to give you beautiful results with TT and root TT. So it doesn't take a genius to try to generalize this pattern. <laughs> a scalar is a zero form with a one form field strength which is nice with TT in two dimensions. A gauge field is a one form with a two form field strength, which is nice with TT in four dimensions. The obvious question is, is a two form with a three form field strength an object which is nice with TT in six dimensions? Um, that's the question which I asked Tetra to work on at some point before he disappeared to go to math camp and was never heard from again. Um, so that, that project, I think, has, has been either put on indefinite holds or I'm just going to try to work on um, by myself at some point. But um, that would be, I mean, if the cube root thing is going to work that, that uh, K-star is suggesting, or even the regular square root thing is going to work nicely in another example, my next guess for an example that would be nice is a three form in six dimensions, um, which is, is something I'm now working on by myself, or maybe a little bit with Gabriella and his student. Um, there was an interesting question from Otium, which is related, which is, uh, what about exponential of TT bar? Exponential of TT, well, TT bar is dimensionful, so you can't exponentiate a dimensionful quantity. If you make it dimensionless with some other parameter, you could exponentiate it. Um, I don't know if that would do anything. Um, it's, yeah, it's not obvious to me whether that would be something nice. I mean, objects like the exponential of TT bar do appear when you do the path integral, at least. I mean, because the path integral is e to the i root action. So when you TT bar deform, you have e to the i root action plus TT bar. So e to the TT bar does appear in calculations. 
like in conformal perturbation theory in my Stephen paper, we do have integral of e to the tt bar, and then you take derivatives with respect to lambda to pull down tt bar operators. So e to the tt bar will appear in calculations of that form, but I assume he's asking about adding e to the tt bar classically to the Lagrangian, made dimensionless in the appropriate way. And um, that I have no, no idea whether to expect it would ever make sense. Uh, it seems like a weird thing to do. I don't know. Uh, yeah, I guess uh, I guess you could ask the same thing about log, right? Okay, so has pointed that out. I think I also pointed that out. Yeah, well, what 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 to say about log? Um, log is kind <laughs> of weird. Um, log would be bad, particular. So your deformation should be something which makes sense, presumably around any field configuration, including a zero energy field configuration. So log TT bar would diverge if the expectation value of TT bar goes to zero, for instance, in the vacuum. So log TT bar would be something that's very strange. Um, it would not be a well-defined deformation in the ground state uh, or in the zero energy state. With that said, um, one way that we've been trying to make sense quantum mechanically of root TT bar is to do a stupid high school manipulation of the following form. Write root TT bar as e to the one half log TT bar. <laughs> so oh, now, right. there's, now there's no square root. Uh, so in that sense, um, if you can make sense of e to the half form oh. in a path integral, which my collaborator Shengdi is trying to make sense of now, with to his credit, a very clever manipulation e to the half log and then doing a hubbard stratonovich transformation to try to um, decouple the log and some uh, he's doing some nice stuff, basically, to try to make sense of it. So one could have some hope that that would do something. Um, so that's a natural place where maybe you would try to use something like a log. But uh, yeah, adding log directly is something I think that would be weird by itself, possibly even weirder than the exponential. So and now people started spamming random functions. So for example, we had um, sine and cosine of tt bar. We also had from K star we had uh, zeta of tt bar. Oh my! As well. Yeah, these are <laughs> all all strange uh, strange suggestions. Yeah, I mean, for any of these you would want. I mean, you can add any relevant operator you want, and most of them are going to be crap. So. Um, in some sense, the reason why TT bar is surprising and interesting is that this particular irrelevant operator looks like it's not crap. Because um, you would expect all of these other things, like the sine or the log or the zeta, or take any analytic function you want and add that function of an irrelevant operator to the Lagrangian. It's almost certainly just going to, uh, I mean, as you flow up the renormalization group to higher energies, it's just going to turn on more and more operators and the theory just becomes out of control. That's usually what happens. Um, the magic is that for TT, that doesn't happen. And maybe for root TT, it doesn't happen. Who knows? But all of these other things, if I had to bet, I would bet money that um, all of them are just going to be random, irrelevant operators that just give you crap. K-Star has asked about the number theory stuff. I think you sent it in this server a while back. Oh, uh, the party stuff. He asked this in the on TT bar deforming modular forms? There has been none as far as I know. So John Cardi came here. He actually lives in Sacramento now. So he, he's very close. He's a 20 minute drive from where I live. So John Cardi oh, came you're, here. You, um, you, you cut out, 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 you cut out. Oh, uh, sorry. Am I, am I not cut You cut out? out at the start of your sentence. So, uh, uh, yeah. I see. Um, yeah, I was saying about the Cardi stuff, about the Cardi modular forms. Um, he came here to give a talk about that. Um, cause he lives in Sacramento. So he's like a 20 minute drive away, which is very convenient. So he came here and spoke to us about the TT modular form stuff. Um, but the question I guess is, have there been any developments or follow-ups on that? And as far as I can tell, no, um, John said he was going to write a second paper because the first one was posted on the math archive and it was more mathy. He said in that paper, he's going to write a follow-up that's more physics oriented. 
uh, explaining some of the same manipulations, but from a more physical perspective. As far as I can tell, he is not, I didn't see it. So he has not written that paper yet. And there have not really been any concrete developments on that side, as far as I can tell. Um, but I do think it's an interesting direction. I, I mean, hopefully people are thinking about it because um, these TT bar to form modular forms are, it's, it's kind of an elegant way of thinking about the partition functions in the deform theory and other observables on a torus. Um, so anyway, I mean, I cited his paper, but um, I don't, I haven't seen a lot of other people doing it. I'm, uh, <clears throat> I'm just spewing random words, which I know are related now, but are there uh, related things for, well, like automorphic forms and, you know, those types of other forms and things that have form in their name? Automorphic form is the one that comes to mind. Yeah. Sort of if you're if you're coming at this from a Langlands perspective or just a pure math perspective, that's that's a natural question to ask. So generalize the modular forms to automorphic forms for some other um, some other group of like SL two Z or something. Um, there has not been any connection, as far as I know, between TT bar and those things, simply because it's harder to understand the emergence of of um, forms of that type. The reason modular forms are important for 2D CFTs is that one of the important objects to study in a conformal field theory is its torus partition function. So you put the theory on a torus, you find its partition function Z, which is in some sense a generating function for certain correlators in the theory. And the partition function Z is modular invariant. So it's, uh, it doesn't transform under modular transformations. And then from that fact, you can um, try to sort of write the partition function as a sum of prod products of different objects that aren't modular invariant, but are modular forms with a particular weight. Um, so for instance, you can involve like the dedicant eta times conjugate of dedicant eta, and dedicant eta is a modular form with fixed weight. So you can try to build partition functions out of these ingredients, trying to cancel all the weights in the right way so that it's modular invariant. Um, so that's why modular forms emerge. Um, it's less obvious how to see automorphic forms emerge in the study of 2D field theories, because um, it doesn't emerge in a natural way from putting the theory on a torus like the, the ordinary modular group does. I mean, I shouldn't say that no one thinks about this. Some of the more mathy people like Jeff Harvey and Greg Moore do think about questions of this form, but um, it seems much harder and it's not something which is like totally mainstream, the way that modular forms are a standard object in every theorist's toolkit. The automorphic form stuff, I think, is more specialized. And for that reason, I haven't seen anything on TT bar and those things yet. Okay, cool. Uh, can I ask a question? Uh, so, what do you think about like non equilibrium QFT and TGFT duality stuff? You said non equilibrium QFTs and these dualities? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it's 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 always interesting to study out of equilibrium um, field theories. This is something that Mukund, my postdoc advisor, um, thinks about a lot. Um, it's something I don't know as much about. So, I mean, th this seems to be more of interest, um, say, in low dimensional field theories where things are under more control. So, like the the SYK model, for instance, is um, a common example where people like to study things like this. Um, in low dimensional examples, things are under better control. It's, I mean, it's very hard to go to out of equilibrium um, just because, I mean, you, the, the reason why equilibrium field theories are nice is because you can just use the partition function and standard thermodynamics and statistical mechanics and things work. When you're studying things out of equilibrium, you don't have any of those tools. So you have to leverage some other symmetry or structure in the problem in order to get results. So, I mean, one way to do that is to go to lower dimensions and study things like SYK which is supposed to be related to certain features of low dimensional gravity. And you can study out of equilibrium properties of SYK, which are related to random matrix theory. So certain observables are distributed the way that um, eigenvalues in random matrices are via like some certain like, semicircle law or for Vichert matrices, there's different distributions and things like that. So that's the context in which I've seen more interesting results on out of equilibrium stuff. Um, you can do classical out of equilibrium stuff, for instance, with, um, so, I mean, for instance, 
something that Mukund and various people have studied are these like black hole quasi normal modes. So this is this like fluid gravity correspondence where you can think of certain modes in gravity solutions, black hole type solutions as being related to certain uh, fluid dynamics type questions. And then you can ask questions like what is the speed of sound um, in the appropriate fluid theory? And these things are out of equilibrium in the sense that um, they're quasi normal modes, which means they're kind of decaying. This is like a sound mode that's um, decaying uh, towards some equilibrium configuration, but you're not in the equilibrium configuration. So th those are interesting things you could do classically. But um, for the, the full question that I think you have in mind when you're asking this, like what, what can I say more generally about um, out of equilibrium field theories quantum mechanically? I mean, that seems like a very hard problem. I, I, I don't have much to comment on um, in that regime. Uh, so one follow-up question, like, uh, so what, what, did, what did you see, like, uh, what did the current state about the gravity through correspondence? Uh, sorry, say it again. The, the question was about the fluid gravity correspondence? Yeah, yeah. What is the current state of the art? Like, uh, how does the community take it? Like, it's been many years, I think, more than 10 years that ideas come up. So what is the current state of that? Yeah, good. I mean, uh, the I think the current state, I mean, it, it all started kind of, you know, in the early 2000s with like these, um, like black folds, this group doing a black folds type calculation where they showed that long wavelength modes and gravity correspond to some fluid stuff. And they were trying to leverage some results from that. But <clears throat> I think the, the more modern perspective has come away from that um, black folds type picture. So I mean, the state of the art, or I'll send you Mukun's last paper about this, where I think this is like um, probably the most sophisticated results that have been obtained recently using fluid gravity stuff. Um, so this charge diffusion. So this was a, a follow-up paper that he, he did um, following up on an earlier paper also with Temple and, and Julio um, about these, uh, sorry, I'll send you, I'm, I'm just gonna spam papers just for references. There's kind of three relevant papers all in a cluster, which I'll just drop a little bit. Um, so there's that one, and then there's the uh, momentum diffusion in the charged plasma. This is, okay. Um, anyway, so I think this this sort of stuff is, I mean, I'm not an expert in this field, so I don't know what the state of the art is per se, but I mean, from from the perspective of an outsider who just talks to people who work on this, it seems like this sort of stuff is kind of like the highest sophistication that people have gotten to. So um, the the, the punchline is that what they're doing is studying this fluid gravity stuff that I talked about for like black holes, but leveraging intuition from holography. So, I, I mean, we've learned something from string theory in the past 30 years, which is that um, gravity is dual to conformal field theories. So you could ask, can I leverage insights from holography using the fact that gravity in particular in ADS, for instance, is dual to some field theory? Can I use holography to extract insights about the correspondence between gravity modes and fluid theory modes. So for instance, do th quantities like the speed of sound in this fluid gravity correspondence have a holographic interpretation? Is there some quantity in a conformal field theory, like a three-point function or some other CFT observable that uh, corresponds to this? And that's what they investigate in these papers for first for uncharged black holes, like ADS black holes, then for charged Reissner Nordstrom black holes, where there's now a gauge field in the game. And you can have charge transport in addition to just momentum transport, which is, I mean, momentum transport is sound. That's the usual sound mode when um, you have some propagating sound mode. So um, this is all, by the way, a spiritual successor to what Damson did years ago. Damson is a condensed matter theorist at UChicago, where I used to be. Um, and what he did was calculate the viscosity of the quark gluon plasma, which is produced in heavy ion colliders like RIC, the relativistic heavy ion collider, RHIC or RIC. Uh, he computed that using holography. So that's held up often as one of the early examples for like these, these clowns who say, oh, string theory doesn't do anything useful. Uh, string theory is crap. I don't see 10 dimensions. Why, why are you still studying string theory? It's experimentally disproven. Like these idiots who repeat these talking points and just don't understand like the big picture that string theory is a mathematical framework that is useful in many contexts. Um, 
This is one of the first concrete examples that you should keep in mind to shut these people up when they say crap like this. It's like string theory is a tool like calculus that you can use to do many things. One of the things you can do with string theory is use holography to compute concrete, real observables, like the viscosity of a quark gluon plasma at RIC, which Son did successfully. And that's what kind of launched him to, to fame. That was one of his big papers and uh, what made him a big deal. So he used holography to understand something in fluid dynamics of, of viscosity. Um, and this Mukun stuff with uh, Loga and also Temple and Julio is in some sense a spiritual successor to that type of calculation where he's leveraging holography to extract insights about a fluid gravity correspondence for black holes. That's why I would say it's like state of the art. This is like a more sophisticated um, extension of that sort of thing, um, if that makes sense. Okay, well, yeah, the random screaming is uh, a really aggressive dog in the next door neighbor's garden, I'm assuming. Yes. Yeah. Sounds like he needs to be euthanized. <laughs> uh, okay, but apart from that, uh, unless there are any more questions, uh, K-Star has no more. Nobody is typing. We'll give it, like, I don't know, 10 seconds. Okay. Uh, so, some minutes back, like, uh, you were suggesting about a paper, I think, uh, something based on integrability and the use of the duality. Can you just, like, uh, uh, you know, uh, share that paper, like, oh, so can you name like T.S. Gabriel or something? Yeah, but like, let me see. Um, yeah, so, I tried to find, I could not. Um, yeah, I don't know if he, I mean, it, his people in his group definitely worked on this. Let me see. Um, another person, hold on, not at the alien T duality. Um, uh, Domenico Orlando also worked on this. Let me see. Maybe I could find one of his papers. Um, oh, here's an example. I mean, there's many papers on this, so I don't know if this is the best one to um, to send, but this one is a an overview. So I would look at this overview. Um, this is by uh, Domenico and his wife, Suzanne, and some other people. Um, so this is like, this is, I mean, this is not a paper with new results. This is like a summary paper that's trying to describe what's been developed in this field over the past few years. But um, part of this paper is explaining um, how to use non-abelian T-duality, which is, if you look in the, um, uh, oh, it's, well, okay. There's, yeah, there's many, of there's no table of contents, but um, if you scroll through, you'll see non-abelian T-duality mentioned in, in many of the sections. So anyway, this review, is explaining how to use techniques like non-abelian t-duality and other stuff, um, killing spinners, all this other stuff, um, to study integrability, in particular through this Yang-Baxter <laughs> deformation. So this Yang-Baxter thing, if you've studied integrability, you'll probably have heard of quite yeah. a lot. There's this Yang-Baxter equation yeah. and deformation. So, yeah, yeah. Um, anyway, so that, that's a good reference. Yeah. And you can look, at the, um, can look at the citations in there for other papers. Yeah. Yeah, thanks. Thank you so much. Good. Uh, okay, well, unless anybody has any questions. Yeah, it's usually a good okay. sign that I've talked too long when the person who was giving the talk has gotten bored and left the group chat. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, uh, if not, then yeah, thanks to uh, Josh who left 10 minutes ago or something for actually giving the talk. And obviously, uh, thanks to Christian Furco for answering this massive bombardment of questions. It was very helpful. Um, yeah, it's a good discussion. I, I, I felt bad that uh, there's some sense stealing the show from Josh, but 
uh, it's and anyway, it was fun and it was useful for everyone else. So I don't feel that bad. Oh, Josh has joined. Yeah, we were just uh, wrapping it up. So yeah, thanks, Josh, for giving the talk and thanks to uh, Christian Furco for answering all the questions. So yeah, yeah, very good. All right, good times. I'll stop the recording.